On this, the first Sunday of 2020, go with me to the gospel as recorded by St. Mark. St. Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 25 through verse 34. A very familiar text of scripture. I'm going to ask that we'll all stand for the reading of God's word in Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 25 through verse 34. Mark chapter 5 verse 25 through verse 34. If you have it, say amen. amen. If not, say hold on. Amen. Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Acts. Amen. So if you're in Malachi, keep turning, and you'll come to the gospel of Mark chapter 5. If not, just open up your address book and look up to the screen and won't nobody know the difference. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through verse 34. Hear the words of the Lord. And a certain woman, somebody say a certain woman, certain. had an issue of blood 12 years. Somebody shout 12 years. Okay. And had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all, somebody shout all, all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind him and touched his garment, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt, somebody shout, she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power uh, had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude throwing thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about and to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And let shall we read verse 24 together. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be thou whole of thy plague. You may be seated in the presence of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for just the privilege of waking up, the privilege of seeing your sunshine, the privilege of breathing your air, the privilege of being in a house dedicated for worship. Father, we thank you for every soul that is gathered here, every person, for we know this is not by accident. You are intentional that you woke us up, that you brought us to this place. And Father, we want to tell you thank you for reading your word. Thank you for this story, this encounter, this woman. Now, Father, open up our minds, open up our hearts, open up our ears that we may hear what you have to say. And Father, use me, your preacher, your vessel, not to be glorified, but that everything that I say may give you glory, for I can do nothing without you, but I can do all things through you. If I stand too high, bring me down. If I stand too low, bring me up, that I may preach boldly the uncompromising word of God. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. And everyone said together, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and look at him with a smile on your face. Grab him by the hand and say, neighbor, amen. pray for the preacher. He's going to talk about an intentional encounter. Somebody say amen. amen. Here we stand on the first Sunday of this new year. Today is the first time in which we have walked into God's house determined to worship him into 2020. Today is the day of renewed commitments that we often call New Year's resolutions committing to eat better, committing to exercise more, committing to take better care of ourselves, committing to go back to school, committing to do something that we have planned and put off for years. But you know what, Salem, resolutions are good, but they are only as strong as the commitment and the discipline of the one making the resolution. Somebody say amen. amen. 
And so if, you don't, if you're not disciplined, if you're not committed, then the resolution will not last more than a few weeks because they are the promises we not make, don't make to other people. Resolutions are the promises that we make to ourselves. But covenants, I will command your attention, are promises that we make to God. Resolutions are promises that we make to ourselves, but covenants are promises that we make to God. And the difference between a covenant and a resolution is that a covenant is built upon God's power and a resolution is built upon our power. People are calling 2020 already a year of clear vision as our ushers has highlighted today. But I got news for you, Salem. Your vision is only as good as the glasses you put on. I wish I had a witness here. I, I, our ushers, they, they, they were so proud to put them glasses on, and they looked good strutting, but half of them had to raise them up because they couldn't see through the lenses. So your vision is only as good as the glasses that you put on. Amen. And, and so you know what, Sam, you know, because I wear glasses, you know, it's good to always keep an old pair of glasses somewhere. So I, I keep somebody, y'all know what I'm talking about. I, I got an old pair of glasses in my office in case I, I lose my glasses or I break them. But the problem is these old glasses got some old scratches on them. Now, I see pretty good that they, they buy three or four prescriptions too old, but Brother Fuller, they got some scratches on it, and I got to be careful because when I put on these old glasses, I'm looking at a new experience through some old scratches. Y'all missed that point right there. I got to be careful because oftentimes I be trying to, to move stuff that ain't there. I be trying to clean stuff that ain't there. And one time I thought I had some stuff on my desk and I kept, kept wiping and wiping, it was already there. And I realized as crazy as I am, it wasn't nothing on the desk, it was a scratch in my glasses. And so what I got news for, you gotta be careful when you take old glasses into a new year. Because you'll begin to fight stuff that you had already killed last year, this year. I wish I can talk to somebody here. You got to be careful when you put old glasses on in the new year. And so if we want to have clarity in 2020, we must be intentional about what we do. Somebody shall be intentional. Here in our text, we have an experience by a desperate woman having an intentional encounter with Jesus. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has a series of encounters um, that began with him meeting a wild man in the cemetery. You know the story, the opening of chapter 5, as well at the end of chapter 4, Jesus crossed over and he tells his disciple, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. And immediately in chapter 5, when he steps out of the boat, he has an encounter with a wild man. We call him wild, but he had an unclean spirit within him. And this spirit was so bad that it drove him out of his home. It drove him out of his community. And he was now in a cemetery howling at the moon at night, cutting himself with stones. They tried to chain him, but he was so strong he would break the chain. They would handcuff him, but he would break the handcuffs. It's amazing that this man could break chains, but he cut the chain that people put on him, but he couldn't break the chain that was inside of him. I got news for you. Some of us are professional chain breakers for external stuff, but it's hard to break chains that's on the inside. And so he was struggling, cutting himself with stone. They heard him howling every night at the moon, but Jesus had an intentional encounter because the moment he steps off the ship, the man sees Jesus and runs to him and says, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus looks at him and discovers that the man not only had one devil inside him, he had a thousand devils on the inside thousand devils on the inside and Jesus healed him. He called that devil called Legion out of him and the man was healed and he was sitting clothed in his right mind and he wanted to go with Jesus. I'm just telling you the story. And Jesus said, you can't go with me. I want you to go home and tell your friends and your family what good things the Lord has done. I got news for you. That's the benediction. Every time you leave church, you ought to go home and tell your family and your friends the good things that the Lord has done. And so he heals him and he sends him home. He crosses over to the other side of the sea again and he encounters a ruler by the name of Jairus. Jairus, this ruler of the synagogue, comes to Jesus not with a theological question. He comes to Jesus in his desperation because he has a daughter. In verse 23 he says, my daughter lieth at the point of death. He's a desperate father 
coming to God with a desperate situation. If I got anybody here that's ever been desperate before, got a desperate situation, you don't need money Friday, you need money now. You, you, you don't need healing next week, you need it right now. It, it, you done already got the, the first warning, the second warning, the, the, the bill done turned from white to blue to pink to red, that is about to turn everything off. You need the Lord to operate right now. He's in a desperate situation. And what I love about it, when you're in a desperate situation, you ain't got time to be fake or phony. When you're in a desperate situation, you ain't got time to be cute. When you're in a desperate situation, you ain't got time to be dignified. That's why you can turn the difference between a cute prayer and a desperate prayer. I wish I had a witness here. Folk that pray cute, they use words they can't spell or pronounce. Folk that try to get, that's why, I, you know, I, I got to, I'm kind of crazy. I look at people and they, they sitting up there, God of our fathers and sundry past who picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on a solid ground, snatched my soul from a burning hot fire, cleaned me up, put me on a rock to stay. And they done prayed 20 minutes and ain't said nothing. But when you're desperate, you ain't got time for a whole lot of words. When you're desperate, all you say is, Lord, have mercy. When you're desperate, you say, Lord, I need you. When you're desperate, sometimes you just say, Jesus. Do I got anybody pray one of them desperate prayers? Lord, that's up. you know what? You don't need but three words to say a prayer. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, I need you right now. And sometimes you can't even say nothing. You just wave your hand and shake your head. And God knows exactly what you need. The man comes in the midst of his desperation and he lays at Jesus' feet and says, I need you to come to my house and to heal my daughter. Because if you don't come, she's going to die. She's already at the point of death. And in my sanctified imagination before he left, Jairus told his daughter, baby, just wait. I'm going to get some help. He goes and finds Jesus. And Jesus agrees to come to his house. And, and we find Jesus in an intentional encounter going to Jairus' house because Jairus is at the point of desperation. But you know what, Salem? Anytime Jesus travels from one place to another, a crowd always gathers. I'm going to preach in a minute. I got a teacher right here. And so a crowd gathers. So as he's going to Jairus' house, a great crowd of people come and they are walking to see what Jesus is going to do at Jairus' house. I'd be remiss, but I got to tell you something about this crowd that gathers. Um, they followed Jesus, watch this, they followed Jesus, not because of what Jesus was doing for them, but for what, what Jesus was about to do for somebody else. Y'all missed that point right there. They followed Jesus, not because what he was about to do for them, but for what he was about to do for somebody else. Oh, I wish I can pray with somebody here. I, I, I got to tell you because they followed him, not because uh, he fed them, not because he healed them, but because he was in the process of about to do something for somebody else. They followed him for what he was about to do. I came to ask you in 2020, can you follow God based upon what he's about to do? Yeah. Oftentimes we follow God on what he's doing. God has to do something. God has to do a new thing. But I got news for you. God got some February miracles, but to get to February, you got to follow him in January. God got some summer blessings, but in order to get to the summer blessing, you got to hold on during the winter time. I wish I can walk with somebody here. You got to learn how to follow God on what God is about to do. And watch this. Here's the caveat. Don't just follow him on based on what he's going to do for you. Sometimes you got to follow him based on what he can do for somebody else. The test of your faith is can you walk with Jesus when he's on, to, on his way to somebody else's house? I know you can shout when he's on your way to your house, but can you shout when your sister get blessed? Can you shout when your brother get blessed? Can you shout when your friend gets a new job? Can you shout when your cousin gets a new car? Can you shout when your nephew gets a promotion? Can you shout when your grandbaby graduates college? Can you shout on what God is doing for somebody else? Or is your praise reserved for you? I got news for you. When you learn how to praise God for what God is doing for somebody else, I let me see if I can make this plain. We, we, 
Uh, 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 anybody ever been to Six Flags? They used to have Six Flags. And they, they used to have this log ride. It's not a very exciting roller coaster, but this log ride, you get in this, 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 this log, and you go up this hill, you don't go very high, and then you splash down, and you splash down. Uh, but but the, you rode the ride, but it's not over. The next thing you do is you stand on the bridge. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You stand on that little bridge, and you see somebody else get on. Somebody else go up the hill, and somebody else come down. And when they come down, the splash don't hit the folk in the boat. It hit the folk standing on the bridge. Y'all ain't going to shout with me here. I came to tell you, you need more folk in your life that don't mind standing on the bridge. I ain't riding, but I'm going to get splashed by what God is doing for you. That's what God wants. I, want to be, I just want to be on the bridge. I ain't got to be in your boat. Just let me stand on the bridge. I, I, I ain't got to be in your ride. I just want, let me tell you, I ain't jealous of your car. I don't want to ride. I just want to stand on the bridge. I, I, don't, I don't have to stay in your house. I just want to stay on the bridge. Because when God is blessing you, there's some residue that'll fly on somebody else. And if you're close enough to folk who are getting blessed, watch that blessing overflow into your life. Right here, I, I hang around people. The reason why I'm so fat, I hang around people that like to eat well. And what I learned, y'all know what I'm Y'all gonna give me a minute. When you hang around folk that like to eat, when they pull up at Williams or when they pull up at Pop, they don't just buy two pieces. They, they get a box of chicken. They, uh, you, you know, I got to hang around folk. They, you know, uh, they, they get a mean case of right all the time. And when you pull up, we'll get a box of chicken and a box of fries. I wish I had a witness here. Now the reason why we would order boxes is because everybody in the car, y'all ain't gonna pray with me here. When you hang around box Christians, as long as you in the car with them, you can eat off of what they, y'all ain't gonna pray with me here. That's why I'm careful who I sit next to on Sunday morning. I need to sit next to folk that got a box mentality. So when God gives you a box of blessing, you will say, you want one? When God gives you a box of miracle, you say, here, get you some. I wish I had a witness here. Can I shout with somebody? Somebody high five your neighbor and say, you want some of this? You want some of this? You can have it. I got more than I can eat. I got more than I can handle. And when I tell you, when I love about it, when I let you eat out of my box, I ain't going to issue you no fry. I'm going to tell you, just reach in and grab as many as you want. Because I got news for you. I come to preach right this morning here, right here in the text. Intention on the counter, you got to be in the crowd. There's something about being in the crowd. I, I know God is going to perform a miracle. They follow Jesus. He's about to perform a miracle. The test of your followership is can you follow Jesus when he's about to bless somebody else? Can you follow him for unselfish reasons? Let me go a little bit further. Can you follow him to watch him bless somebody else? And watch this, just because I, I want to follow him just to see him heal somebody, just to see him deliver somebody, just to see him set somebody free, just to see him transform somebody's life, just to see him transform somebody's mind, just to see him take somebody from poverty into wealth, just to see him change somebody's life around, just to see him take somebody from obscurity into the public realm. I just want to see God do it. Why do I want to see him? Because if I can see him do it for you, then I know he can do it for me. Y'all ain't going to shout with me right here. Um, because watch this. They say, I got to follow him because it's Jairus' daughter today. It may be my daughter tomorrow. But if I see him raise Jairus' daughter today, when my daughter gets sick, I know exactly who to call. I know exactly who to go get. I got news for you. You better hang around folk that got some experiences with the Lord. Because let me tell you, they'll save you a whole lot of money and a whole lot of heartache and a whole lot of disappointment. Because I don't know about you, but too many times I don't call my uncle, I don't call my aunties, I don't call my cousin, and they don't get me because they got problems of their own. But if you learn how to go to Jesus the first day, if you learn how to go to Jesus when you first get in trouble, then watch God make ways out of no ways right here in the text here. He goes, the crowd follows him. But I can tell you something else. You can't follow Jesus without worshiping Jesus. Oh, I feel like preaching here. They're worshiping Jesus. And as they're traveling, I'm having a good time this morning. As they're traveling, uh, you can't follow him without worshiping him. And when you worship him, you're gonna, you have a tendency to make some noise. Somebody shout, make some noise. 
You have a tendency to make noise, but watch this. I, I wish I could find another word for, no, for noise because worship is not really noise. Noise is really sound without purpose. But worship is sound that is saturated with the love of God. And it leads towards the transformation of the people who hear the sound. Are y'all going to walk with me here? And so my worship has the ability to transform somebody else. In 2020, I want our worship to be so impactful, so intentional, that it leads to the transformation of everybody who experiences our worship. I want everybody who come in this experience how we love God, how we worship God, and their lives are transformed by the sound of the worship that we experience here. But Jesus walks to Jairus' house and he's intentional because he's strategically taking certain streets. He's not going on the highway. He's not in the Uber. He's not taking Uber. He's not in the HOV lane. He's not taking the direct route. He's taking the side streets. He's taking down through some alleys, over some fields. Why is he taking the long way to Jairus' house? It's because he got an encounter. Y'all ain't going to pray with me here. Why, Jesus, why don't you take the shortest way possible? Because I want to make sure I walk close enough to a woman's house that is suffering from an issue of blood. Are y'all going to help me walk here? Um, because in the same community, there's a woman facing the finality of her condition. For, but let me tell you, in verse 27, it says, but when she heard Jesus was passing by, I always wondered, Sister Turner, who knocked on her door? And said it was Jesus. Who sent her an email? Who sent her a text? Say, Jesus is walking by your door. Nobody knocked on her door. No one texted her. She heard the sound. Y'all ain't going to pray with me. She heard the sound of the worship that was going on. And she said, it must be Jesus passing by my house. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, for we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. Watch this. Let me tell you how God's intentional. Jairus' daughter gets sick, leads to Jairus' going to Jesus, which led a crowd gathering, following Jesus and worshiping, which made so much noise that it disturbed a woman that she could hear it inside of her house. And she transformed her life because what she heard the crowd say, she said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. And to understand this statement, you must understand the desperation of her condition. In verse 25, she had an issue of blood for 12 years. Somebody shout 12 years. The issue of blood for 12 years. Watch this in Mark chapter 29. Mark calls her, in Mark uh, verse 29, he calls it a plague. In the beginning, he calls it an issue. But in 29, he says it's a plague. Now, because I like the original language, I went to the Greek, and I looked up the word that's translated plague. And it disturbed me because the word translated plague is a word that describes a whip that you use to drive horses. Y'all Yo, ain't going to pray with me here. So, so, so what, I, I, got, I got offended by that term. I said, why would you, you describe this woman's condition as being whipped as a horse would be driven with a whip or, or, or a scourge? I didn't understand it until I connected it to verse 26 when it says that the woman suffered from many things, of many physicians, and she didn't get better. She got worse. Has anybody spent more money and got worse. More time, and it got worse. More effort, and it got worse. Here it is, she, she, and, and, and when I thought about this and I hooked it up with the word plague, what, what, what Mark was trying to tell us is that her condition was so bad, her condition was driving her. It drove her where to spend her money. It drove her where to spend her isolation. She was at home isolated because her condition was a plague that led to her being unclean and she was not allowed to be in public. Her condition was determined where she went and where she didn't win. It was a scourge. It was a whip. Every time she would want to go to some public place, her, her, her condition would whip her and move her back to isolation. Every time she got another check, her condition would whip her and make her go to another doctor to spend more money and lose everything. I don't know about you, but anybody had been suffering from, from a condition that was driving you. When you tried to go right, it made you go left. When you wanted to go left, it made you go right. It, it told her what she could and couldn't go. It told her what she could and couldn't do. It told her what she could focus on and what she couldn't focus on because she needed relief from somebody and all she had was money. You know she was a woman of substance because she had money. 
She can afford to go to doctors, but I got news for you. If you keep spending, you eventually won't have nothing left to spend. She's spending. The bank account has dwindled. The savings account has been closed out. The 401k has all the money has been resolved. She now has nothing because she has a plague in her condition. Let me make it relevant. Uh, racism can be a plague. Sexism can be a plague. Poverty can be a plague. Low education can be a plague. Economic struggles can be a plague. Gentrification in a community that was once vibrant can be a plague. There might have been a way up and talk to me. There's some plagues going on. When they intentionally take food stamps from people who are starving, there's some plagues going on. There's some plagues going on when you make decisions that affect folks' lives and you only see it as a savings on a bank account, but you don't realize how many lives are being destroyed. There's some plagues going on. It's a plague when you can take health care. I'm sorry for getting social justice. It's a plague when you can take away health care from folks that can't afford their medicine, can't afford to go to the doctor, can't afford to go to rehab, and you say it's all right. There's some plagues going on. It's some plagues of drugs, some plague of alcoholism, some plague of all of these things that are going on in our lives. But when she heard the sound of worship in the midst of her plague, she said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I know this woman stood up in the midst of her sickness and transformed her own life. Can I tell you something? Stop waiting on folk to tell you when to get up. You got to learn how to get your own self up. Stop telling folk, that, how can I be real with somebody? You don't need folk to tell you it's going to be all right. You don't need folk to tell you stop crying. You don't need folk to say get up and clean your face. You ought to talk to yourself sometimes. What I love about this worship, this worship was so strong, she talked to herself. And she said, if I can but touch the hem of his gun, I shall be made whole. She was intentional. Salem, this year, God wants our worship to be so intentional that it makes folk talk to themselves. Have you ever been in church and it, it gets so good to you and some get moving to you on your own the inside and you start talking to yourself? You say, I remember when I was down. I remember when I was low. I remember when I didn't have. I remember when God picked me up. I remember when God touched mama. I remember when God pulled my marriage together. I remember. And the more you talk to yourself, uh, suddenly your hands start raising up. The more you talk to yourself, suddenly your mouth starts open and you were talking to yourself. Now you're getting louder and louder. And folk are looking at you like, what in the world? are you talking about? I got news for you. I'm not bipolar. I'm not schizophrenic. I, I, I took my medicine this morning. I'm just thinking about how good God has been to me. Do I got anybody here that don't mind folk looking at you crazy? Don't mind folk. If you don't like what I'm talking, move up to the balcony, baby, because I got to tell somebody how good God has been. I don't know what he's done for you, but somebody ought to take 10 seconds and talk to yourself. Don't you remember when he got you up? Don't you remember when he healed you? Don't you remember when he wiped tears from your eye? I don't, baby, I don't need an organ. I don't need a piano. I got enough to say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Somebody ought to tell God thank you. Somebody ought to tell him hallelujah. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. The worship was so powerful. The worship was so powerful. That's why I love when the choir get to sing and they sing and they singing so good. Next thing you know, I look out in the audience and I see folks' mouth moving. I see people singing to themselves. That's what worship does. Worship is contagious. It's just like, it's like chicken pox. Let me tell you, it's just like in, in my house, in my house. Uh, first of all, first of all, uh, Ella got strip throat. Then, then Miles got strip throat. Then my wife got strip throat. And then the doctor said, it must be something in your house. Y'all ain't going to pray with me here. What the doctor was trying to tell the reason why everybody's catching it is because it's in the house. I wish I can talk to somebody here. If we want folks to catch on to the Holy Spirit, it got to be in the house. It got to be floating around here. It got to be so when someone come in, I feel pretty good. If God, somebody tell you, you better be careful. It's in the house. There's some praise in the house. There's some anointing in the house. There's some healing in the house. There's some deliverance in the house. There's some hallelujah in the house. And if you don't want it, you better not come in here. I wish I had a witness here. It's in the house. It's something. It's in the house. And 
Mm. Am I preaching right this morning here? Yeah. Oh, watch that. Why not? Here she This woman's sick. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's pale. White as a sheep. Too weak to move. But she started talking to herself. And I can just see mama in her bed. And when she hear the sound of the worship, she said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. See, that Greek word means she said it not only one time, but she repeated it. And so I remember, and so now she's not only laying in the bed, now she's sitting on the side of the bed, saying, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She looked down, she was barefooted, but now she got her shoes on. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. She slipped off her nightgown and put on a duster. Y'all ain't gonna pray with me. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. Her hair wasn't combed, so she took a do-rag and tied it up. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She didn't have time to put her dentures in. She just rinsed with some Listerine. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I ain't got gas in my car, but if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I got news for you. I told you New Year's Eve. I'm going to tell you right now. You always go where you thinking. If you start thinking you're going to make it, watch it make it. If you start thinking you're going to get to Jesus, watch you get to Jesus. This woman who was too sick to move, too sick to get dressed, too sick to get out of her house, now she's walking down the crowd. And I got news for you. The crowd was so thick, the woman was so weak, but she had to crawl her way. Sometimes you got to move folk out of your way. Y'all just here to be seen, but I got to touch him. Mm. If I can but touch, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. The shouting part is, do you remember what Mark calls that condition a plague, which means a whip? It was Druze to drive horse. For the first time, Dr. Lee, I shouted when I said this. For 12 years, her condition was driving her. But now, She's driving her condition. I wish I could shout with somebody here. I don't know how long you've been dealing with it. I don't know how long you've been praying over it, but it's time for you to start driving your condition. You're not going to tell me what I can and can't do. I'm going to tell you what you can't do. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, sickness. Get behind me, poverty. Get behind me, depression. Get behind me, anxiety. Get behind me, cancer. Get behind me, diabetes. Get behind me. Because I'm in the driver's seat now. I got news for you. Stop letting your condition drive your car. I went right here in the text. She's driving the condition. For the first time, she's whipping her condition. Her condition was whipping her for 12 years. But now, she's whipping her condition. And she says, in verse 29, when she touched him, the fountain of her blood dried up. Now, hear me when I tell you this. She, 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 she touched him. Fountain of her blood dried up. But something missing because she doesn't tell us what his clothes felt like. I, I wish Marcus said this. I want to know, was he wearing silk? Was he wearing polyester? Or, or, or was he wearing a blended material? But she said, I, I, I can't tell you what his clothes felt like. I, in other words, I can't tell you what it felt like to touch him, but I can tell you what it felt like when he touched me. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna shout with me here. What she said, it, what, what, it's not important what his clothes felt like. What's important is what, what, what I felt like when he touched me. And the Bible says that, watch this, it uses two words. It says that the fountain of her blood dried up, but then it says she felt in her body that her plague 
Ooh, I wish I could shout with somebody here. She says that for the first time she felt that she was healed of her plague. I don't know what it felt like, but in my sanctified imagination, for the first time in 12 years, she felt healed. She felt set free. I don't know about you, but it's hard to describe what freedom feels like. But baby, you know it when you feel it. I don't know what you've been struggling with, but has God ever set you free from something? I don't know what his clothes felt like, but I know what it felt like when he touched me. It made me feel stronger. It made me feel better. For the first time, I don't feel the weight of my condition. For the first time, I don't feel the weight of my poverty. I don't feel the burden of my illness. I don't feel the struggle of my medication. I don't feel the weight of my experience. I don't feel the, 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 the burden of what I'm going through. For the first time, I've set, I'm set free. And let me tell you, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. When God sets you free, Watch him turn your life around. When God sets you free, watch him heal your body. When God sets you free, watch your mind go all the way around the world. When God sets you free, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody that needs to be set free from some stuff. I don't know what you're going through, but I got news for you. Your condition won't drive you no more. You're going to start driving your condition. Your depression ain't going to stop you no more. You're going to tell your depression. I ain't got time to be bothered today. I got things to do. I came to shout with somebody. Is there anybody here that want to be set free? Is there anybody here that want to be delivered? Is there anybody here want God to bless you? Want God to change your life around? God, I need you to set me free. For the first time, the shackles are off. For the first time, the plague is lifted. For the first time, I don't feel what I'm going through. For the first time, I'm free to move around. I'm free to shout. I'm free to give God praise. I'm free to dance. I'm free to praise. I'm free to shout. I'm free to worship. I'm free to tell God what I want. I'm free. I don't, I don't worry about what folks say. I don't worry about what people look at me. I don't worry about what people might think about me. I'm free. Let me tell you, when you're free, you don't worry about what folks say. When you're free, you don't worry about what folk may think. When you're free, the only thing that matters is I'm free in the Lord. And because God has freed me, I'm going to tell him hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I got news for you. I wasn't there. I didn't touch the hem of his garment. I didn't feel my plague lifted. But I remember one Sunday in Sunday school when Paul Deacon Foster said we opened the doors of the church. I didn't know what he was talking about. But my brother got up first. My cousin got up second. And some got to moving on the inside of me. I said, I don't know no theology, but I know I love Jesus. And Jesus set me free. And I don't know about you, but it was a long time till I learned. One Friday on Calvary, he hung, bled, and died. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in the palm of his hand. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, our fear is gone. I can't tell you what he felt like, but I can tell you what it felt like when he touched me. Some things in life you'll never be able to explain. And some things you don't have to explain. My wife tells me all the time, you, you don't know, I love these children differently than you do. I said, no, you don't. She said, you don't know. They were in me. <laughs> Y'all don't know what I'm talking about here. She said, I know you're their father, but, but it's something about uh, that child that's walking around was in me. And there's a love that I can't describe. I can't tell you how it's different. But I can tell you it's different. Why does God love you unconditionally? It's because he carried you for a while. It's because he carried you over mountains. He carried you through valleys. And he says, I love you unconditionally. And I love you so much that I gave my son to die for you. I let my son die while I held you in my arms. I got news for you. She touched him. They used to sing a song, oh, he touched me. 
Oh, he touched me. And the joy that fills my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. I can't describe it, but I know he touched me. Anybody, I, I don't know, but somebody here was so sick. The doctor don't know which medicine turned you around. But it's because God looked down from heaven and touched you and made you whole. I'm praying God to touch families, touching marriages, touching children, touching schools, touching churches, touching our government, touching your life. And when he touched it, don't focus on what his clothes feel like. Focus on what it felt like when he touched you. 